these days, people worship food like a god. The country is a mess. Everyone in it is starving. The queen, along with her treacherous family, is fast to fill its stomach. Not much hope for us, is there? We're all gonna die soon. These dying souls are a necessary sacrifice. We can put an end to it. Turn a blind eye just this once. I have only one true desire. To see the Heiwon Cho clan punished for destroying our nation. They oppress the people still devastated by war. They deliberately starve the people. And now this plague, the Heiwon Cho clan's greed is at the root of everything. Open your eyes and ears now! I am here not because I care for the throne. The people of this land regard food as a god, and the king must serve his people as such. How many corpses are lying beneath the water of this pond? But to make them behave as if the number is zero, that is true power. Countless more will need to die. To protect you, I will use that power, Father. And do not forget who gave you that power, or that I can just as easily pull it away. Do you desire power? Will you do anything to your serpent? Even as you serve the king, are you willing to commit such heinous deeds? And what have you done to earn this? You were merely born into luck as the king's son. To you, we're nothing but insects. You are correct. You are monsters. You brought the misery upon the people! There's been an illness that spread with a fresh craving for the blood and flesh of the living. Putting everything we struggled for at risk. You have cursed me with this since you were a girl. You were gifted at birth with a wicked cunning, but you have always been foolish. I'm about to have everything you ever wanted. This kingdom must fall at my feet. If the throne cannot be mine, no one can have it. People of this land are suffering. Now is the time to rise up. No matter what happens, you must survive. Your survival proves that you are different from them, and that you are different from me. Prove it to them. Show them what a true king ought to be. I somewhat recently covered a Netflix zombie series picking apart everything wrong with Black Summer. Because let's face it, 95% of what the characters do and how the zombies act just don't make any sense. But I wanted to take this next streaming production into a positive light and go over what made Kingdom so great. You may think I have a bias towards Korean made cinema considering how much I praised Train to Busan. Which, ironically, I've seen the series referred to as Carriage to Busan, which Dongne is the old name of Busan, while Han Young is the old name of Seoul. But beyond its Korean heritage and production, there is just something about this Netflix adaptation that really had me hooked and did more as a zombie series than most in recent memory. Touching on subjects of historical hierarchy in the Joseon province of Korea, portrayal of class division, exposing the true nature of man, reeling you in with fantastic action sequences, and utilizing the zombies themselves for true horror without restriction and desperate situations that force development in people and society to come together or fight each other to the death, whether it be for the betterment of others through selfless actions or corruption to seize control for betterment of self. This week we are telling you why Kingdom is more than a zombie series. Keep in mind, this video will be discussing the entirety of the series, so be forewarned, there are MAJOR SPOILERS AHEAD as we cover seasons 1 and 2. So if you want to watch the series without knowing what happens, feel free to head on down to Netflix, watch it right now, and come back after you've had your 12 hour binge. But I cannot discuss the greatness of this series without giving out some plot points that show off the amazing writing and cinematography. Based on the webcomic series Kingdom of the Gods, set during Korea's Joseon period, a few years after the Japanese invasion of Korea that ended in 1598, we are thrown in the midst of a conspiracy to overthrow the current royal family by pinning treason allegations against the current crown prince, Lee Chang, by the insidious Heiwang Cho clan, by not only utilizing a new sickness to their advantage, but individually doing whatever they can to seize power through any means and lives necessary, while the prince fights to uncover the 
mysteries and deadly seed they sow into Joseon's soil. From the very intro, we are given subtle context as to the very nature of the series that makes more and more sense as the hours pass. A corpse, dressed in royal garbs, being slowly revealed by hemp tapestry, showing all of this extravagant clothing only to have its neck bound in chains, as its body is covered in acupuncture, its nostrils inhaling incense as the incense itself rises like smoke amongst the darkness. The corpse's mouth gagged with salt and a strange liquid that is derived from a simple violet plant. A singular needle penetrates the forehead of this dead body, as we eventually get images of the rampant zombies we will come to expect, and the body itself opening its eyes to show a pure, white, soulless, pupilless gaze. What serves as a precursor to the events of the series also serves as an example of everything today's video will discuss. From the terror of the zombies themselves and the short imagery of the illusions in the king himself, the divide of class in the king's wardrobe giving more impact behind a revealed dead body, and tradition expressed by the medical procedures of acupuncture, aromatherapy, and the method of wrapping a corpse in hemp cloth, all while powerful Korean music plays as the viewer ponders the meaning of the flower and injection in the royal's body, obviously turning him into what will be a main focus of the story and driving force of the horror. Now, upon first glance, the zombies are what you would expect from the xenotype of zombie deviated from 28 Weeks Later, Dawn of the Dead's remake, World War Z, and of course, Train to Busan but are given much more depth to their origins and explanation behind their makeup. The carnage they bring with them and the setting they are placed in give a fresh take for the zombie genre, going back to a time way before militaries were given standard issue firearms and being adept at swordplay were the standard, giving for much more closer calls and fearful encounters with the characters throughout the series. But what is most terrifying, more than not being able to defend yourself with a firearm, is the fact that it can spread so fast within a few hours, create hordes of flesh-eating monsters, and how powerless it can make you feel, stemming from a plant, the resurrection herb, being ground into a fine powder and being injected as a liquid into the cerebellum, and that can bring back a person from the dead, but as a mindless, flesh-craving monster. If brought back in this manner, they will, however, not be able to turn others into zombies through a bite, but can still cause severe enough symptoms to cause death. If, however, people consume the flesh of an infected, they will become the type of zombie that turns others into the undead monsters, the major cause of this plague. These zombies also spread through a bite. The rate of transmission is extremely fast, killing an infected person in moments, seconds flat, and then reanimating them swiftly. They are mostly dead, but will not reanimate if the center of the brain is damaged or the corpse has decayed. If exposed to sunlight during warmer weather, they will flee to dark, dank, shadowy places to hibernate till dusk. The infected are later revealed to not rely on the advent of night to awaken, but rely completely on temperature and cool weather to thrive, much like the resurrection herbs that started this outbreak. Sounds of rigor mortis stricken bones and flesh crack from their bodies as the foul, overpowering stench of decay lingers around them, and viciously pursue anyone they see, and sometimes give up after losing line of sight, but will swarm together toward any sources of sound and bombard all defenses and walls walls until they are destroyed. They will eat any living organisms, including horses and insects. Much like sharks in open water, these monsters can smell blood from far away and rush to its source without hesitation. They cannot swim and actively avoid bodies of water unless giving chase, where they will plummet and then sink. Due to their hate for heat, they will also actively avoid open flames and raging fires. They can only be killed by removing the head, destroying the brain, or giving a fatal enough wound to the neck. Those who are bitten by an infected can be cured by being fully submerged in water, expelling and killing what looks like living worms from the body. By season 2's finale, we are also shown that a freshly infected victim can be saved from reanimated death if their bite wounds are submerged in water, expelling the parasites once again and killing them, revealing that the resurrection herb actually harbors eggs of these parasites that are the root cause of the zombie disease as they flow through a victim's bloodstream and hijack the brain, so long as the brain itself 
is fully developed. Babies and infants themselves are immune to the parasites until they come of age. Chaos in such a tiny package. Now what I've said may have been a lot, but the bottom line is a parasite's eggs nesting in a beautiful flower that could bring back the dead by invading the brain of a host, where only the purity of water could extinguish them, and the destructive nature of fire and heat to ward it off. Devouring the flesh of such victims would allow it to magnify and worsen as it festered in the decaying corpses, allowing newer corpses to spread the disease even further. The virus was originally found and used to fight back against the Japanese by infecting innocent civilians brutalized by Japanese war. It would be further used to infect the king to technically keep him alive long enough for a rightful heir to be born. If I say he's lost his mind or craved human flesh, what is he then? He is very much alive, so would you deny that he is still the king? His majesty is still alive. Her majesty will bring a young prince into the world. He must stay alive until then. The true plague occurs after someone who was bitten died and his body offered as meat for a soup. Those that ate it in the poor village of Dongne would soon die and come back to life as monsters that could spread the disease through bites. With how fast it can infect and bring back people, it's no wonder it spread like wildfire. We get explanations of the virus, how it started, how it spread, how the infected act with direct explanation, or just simply showing it to the audience without going overboard, and most of all, no vague time skips that skim over how the infected took over the wider population. We get to see the beginning of it all. The zombies themselves look, act, and gather in a viciously unsettling manner, drenched in blood. Some of the scenarios they place the zombies into make for creative and memorable moments, including the two bound prisoners in episode 2 making both of their attempts at consuming and escaping both futile. Children falling prey to the disease and even using their small stature to their horrific advantage, swords impaled into their bodies being unintentionally used as their own weapon to impale the living, and subsequently double headshotting these infected, the way they tragically dogpile under buildings to hibernate in dark places, looking like, ironically, victims of war crimes that were hidden. The continuous shot of the fight at the Queen's Palace between each main character fighting the Horde, and just every single scene from their minuscule beginnings spreading to their expansive screaming groups. Throughout the series, the zombies represent a litany of horrors that had and have befallen not only the kingdom, but humanity. From the rampant issue of never-ending hunger in the wake of tragedy that turned the people to literally eating each other alive, to the senseless death and destruction that lies in their wake spurred from individuals from throughout history who use war and suffering to meet their own goals. And of course disease as it cripples the nation spreading from a select few to the unwilling masses without remorse as it takes so much in so little time. All starting from Dr. Lee Sung-hee bringing back the dead body of his assistant Dan Yi, killed by the turned king, to his own village. With the tiger hunter Yong Shin, who came from the war-stricken and impoverished south, who survived by doing anything necessary, makes the decision to feed the desperate and starving people Dan Yi's decaying and very much infected corpse to them. Knowing the people would graciously eat whatever meat they could, they all soon fell ill to the virus as it mutated within them, falling victim to the illness spurred from the rising darkness of the country. There's this meat after death. Is it better for us to all stop? How do you think the people in the south have survived, huh? Do you believe that the king saved them? No. The bones and flesh of their deceased neighbors helped keep them from starving to death. At the end of Season 2, Episode 4, we see a poor man fishing by himself for hours, saying how people tend to worship food like a god, citing a religious book. And as he finally has a fish on the line, due to the prince's lack of knowledge of basic fishing, Prince Cheng accidentally destroys the fishing pole and inadvertently the poor man's chances for finding a morsel of food, ironically with both of them being distant relatives of each other. A king so detached from the common man and how they struggle to eat and stay alive, and his disconnection causes further harm to the people he looks out for. That just means this country has gone to hell. The royal bloodlines. It doesn't matter who it belongs to, your highness or I, or even some lowborn, we all bleed the same blood. 
Throughout the beginning of the series, we see villages of people living in squalor, the children defecating and also playing in the waterways in the streets, nearly starving as they scrape by each day just trying to survive and attain any food they can, all while people of the higher class have their shoes put upon their feet by their own subjects, high class individuals abandoning desperate situations while eating luxuriously while their own people can only wait to be killed by the undead, and even the newly appointed Governor Cho Byum Paul and his council kicking food to the ground without a care in the world while their guards themselves stare hungrily at the discarded morsels. The people are conflicted consistently on who to follow, with the Queen's family of the Cho clan using their status to reign in the people, while those of the King's bloodline, like Li Chang, are constantly having to fight back. This strife between the royal bloodline and its usurpers causes a majority of the death and destruction that proceeds throughout the first two seasons. Although even before this conflict, the Japanese-Korean War was enough to strike the country with poverty and little food to eat. But this conflict just sends everything overboard. We constantly see random outside perspectives of the main cast, and much of the time, all common people can do is just bow to them, cower, run away, or just merely comment on how screwed they are if a person of such high acclaim can be killed by the plague and how futile it is for them to try and survive on their own. The people are the root of the country and their hunger is no small matter as stated by writer Yoon Hee Kim as she directly addresses this as the main focus of the narrative. <laughs> As stated earlier, the people are desperate to eat and feed their families, and will take any chances they can get to fill their bellies, even raiding a destroyed boat of nobles that had food and supplies in it, despite it being soaked in blood. Of all the scholars that were being tortured because of postings of the king's death, one specific scholar even says the queen's family only seeks to feed their stomachs. Li Chang's personal bodyguard even risked being beheaded by stealing the crown prince's food for his pregnant wife while he slept. Although Li Chang caught him, the prince spared his life. I deserve to be executed for touching your table. I beg you, please take pity on my wife. My wife is pregnant and she's struggling with morning sickness. She needs nourishment, and I am unable to provide that for her. I know it's wrong to steal, but I hope you understand it was for my wife. Since it was for a noble cause to feed his family, and not just for himself, Li Cheng, as the good that can arise from those in power and wealth, will often go out of his way, risking his own life to make sure the people are rescued, properly fed, and most importantly, will spare their lives even if their crimes are of a high degree. He does not fight for wealth to live lavishly. He does not fight for power to rule over the people and use them as he pleases. He fights to make a better land for the people so that they may live happily and peacefully. He embarks on his journey to find the answers behind his father's ailment, despite his bodyguard saying he is leaving behind a life of luxury and possibly being murdered by bandits. He notes the sacrifices of the scholars who would not admit to treason and feels it is his duty to do what he can for the country. Lee will not leave a person behind to die. With impending infected reawakening, he falls back to wagons of elderly that cannot move on their own to get them to safety at the risk of his own life. Lee will often question question himself if he is unable to save those around him, or if he must make the choice to incarcerate or kill someone, even if they have betrayed or looked to take his life as the living or dead. However, the opposite of Li Chang can be said for the Cho clan, who seeks to overthrow his family's rule in the most inhumane and evil ways possible. The son of Lord Cho Hak Ju admits to this saying they are earning their right to power and saying that the prince was merely born into luck. The Cho clan dangerously utilizes the poor in numerous ways to meet their goals, whether it be turning dying and sick people of war-stricken villages into zombies to surprise attack the Japanese. These dying souls are a necessary sacrifice. The Cho clan fed innocent people to the zombified king to satiate his appetite, all while keeping the secret of his death under wraps, manifesting as the imagery of a king turned evil, feeding off the very life force of his subjects and countrymen, pinning acts of conspiracy on the prince so that they may kill him and any of those that support him, even from the start, torturing the scholars to force a fake admission of guilt. They would even execute someone who had no knowledge of Li Chang's location. Where is the crown prince? I do not know, sir. 
just to set an example. The Cho Clan, giving an executive order to execute every single member of the five armies and their entire families, children included, the mother's side, the grandfather's side, anybody who sided with this supposed traitor, who was actually in the right, only to make further examples of anyone who dares defy the Cho Clan's attempt at tyrannical rule. The Queen, sacrificing people under the very palace, turning them into the dead as a last resort to unleash upon any rebellious efforts, willing to destroy her very own country if it means she loses power and control. This corruption gives us a second enemy for the protagonist and those around him. They not only have the dead to fear and fight back against, much like apocalyptic scenarios involving the zombie genre, those that live can pose even greater threats. But instead of people fighting to survive however they can, we have the living nemesis of this tale festers from being misdirected and controlled by the Haewong Cho clan's greed. These are poor, desperate people that took jobs they needed to support their families and they're only following orders, all representing how those in power can see to using the general population as nothing more than pawns for their ultimate goals, since they are not of royal lineage while killing anyone that opposes them against the chaos. Near the end of the second season, Li Cheng devises to lure the royal guard away so that his group may invade the capital in order to take down the queen, dressing in clothing of the common poor man. This in order to not only stealthily approach the royal palace, but also to give weight to what the common man can achieve and fight back against the corruption of those in power, the symbolism of the common man going against the throne of the lavish queen. In the end, those of the Cho clan all met their ultimate fate from their own sins. The head, Cho Hakju, who betrayed his own country and used awful power to attain it, almost succumbed to the very illness and exact strain of the disease he instilled in the king before him, visibly becoming the two-faced man he was all along. But even after overcoming the plague, he ended up dying by his own daughter's hand through poisoning so that she may rule. He was murdered by deceit by his offspring who he had instilled the idea that power must come at any cost. Even the most powerful will go at each other. The queen, who callously allowed the plague to rekindle into a roaming fire that destroyed the common man, callously allows herself to be consumed by the horde that she allowed to be created. But ironically, after killing so many pregnant mothers and women who had given birth, the bastard son she held in her hands would actually be saved. She would eventually rear her ugly head once more to be just another monster amongst the masses. But all in all, the plague does come back, signifying the power-hungry disease the Cho clan created as it seeped and spread through the queen's palace and eventually throughout the country. The only member of the Cho clan to noticeably survive these events would be the cowardly governor Cho Byum Pal, who had been appointed to his position by his uncle, Hak Ju. Despite appearing to be someone who only lives to protect himself, once he was around the selfless acts of Li Cheng and his group, he starts to doubt the selfish decisions of himself, his superiors, and his equals, who often assume the worst of lower people and use their lives however they see fit. This leads us to my next point. Korean culture and tradition also play an important part in the series. From the beautifully made costume design, I mean, look at these, they look amazing. And then these set pieces that give us these amazing shots. I mean, look at some of these shots that they have in this series. They, they just accurately portray feudal Korea while giving just a beautiful set piece for us to just soak in. We get an authentic look back at Korea 400 years ago. I cannot get over the imagery, the cinematography, and beautiful shots that kingdom presents. But more so than astonishing imagery, traditional standards play their role going forward. Governors and aristocrats assumed the zombie outbreak was merely an uprising of disgruntled peasants as they first witnessed the chaos. These peasants are attacking noblemen! Soon after the first major attack, the tiger hunter Yong Shin says the bodies of the deceased must be burned or beheaded before the next nightfall. The living common people seeing these numerous bodies of family and friends refused for this proposal to burn, mutilate, or do anything to a body outside of traditional burial and ceremonies would be considerably dishonorable. We must, we must 
bury them. Even if you bury them, they will crawl out. You must cut their heads from the bodies or burn them. Who says you may burn the corpses? The former army commander that is his mother. How mother. dare you desecrate the deceased? If you so much as lay a finger on him, you should have to answer to me. If you Neither. touch the bodies of my family, you should have to answer to me. Typically, for a deceased Korean individual, one would hold the body within their home for days at a time and serve meals, celebrate their life, wrap their bodies within hemp cloth, having mourning periods of up to three days, bringing shamans to purify grave sites of evil spirits, and making coffins bound in rope to descend the body into the earth. But the bottom line is that burial and traditional ceremony were the only option for the soul to rest in peace, and the people would refuse such fates for the bodies of their loved ones. Going back to the divide in wealth and poverty, Governor Cho byung Paul and his advisor suggest a different method. We could burn them, just the commoners and the aristocrats. They will be given a nice funeral. Then we put them deep, huh? Very deep into the ground will it never bother anybody. How can we differentiate nobles and peasants? Why? The bodies dressed in silk could simply be separated from the bodies dressed in rags. They suggest burning the bodies of no worth peasants because who are they besides just worthless people? And burying those of noble aristocrats deep in the ground to prevent them from coming back successfully and appeasing the upper class. Although these actions would never be carried out as the living commanders and high officials would flee Dong Lei before nightfall and leave the poor to fend for themselves as the zombies would eventually reanimate. In a fit of irony though, a grieving mother aboard the ship that they escaped on, not accepting her son's death, kept his body in a chest to hopefully eventually bury it properly, opening it at night for her son to break out and infect most of the nobles aboard. Many times we see the common man doing something so simple, like a child accidentally hitting Prince Chang with the ball. The prince calls them to his presence. The children automatically cry out with tears. Your Highness, the four of us deserve to be killed for what we did to you. For something so simple, just a ball hitting the prince. But for that time period, it was customary for the people to throw their lives down for what seems like a dishonorable action. Thankfully, our Chad of a prince offers them food instead of execution, showing humanity amongst some rather horrible traditions. Although, I would say it would be up to the mercy of those that ruled in leadership created through lineage. Most importantly, the villain of our story, Lord Cho, uses tradition to his and his clan's advantage, stating since the king is still technically alive since he's a zombie, that his throne is still taken, the king is still there, and as long as he may live, any proper heirs may take over once his untimely death were to occur, namely for the queen to brew up a baby and give birth to a proper son, so that they may rule in place of Prince Li Cheng. So basically using the loopholes of monarchy by keeping the king alive long enough for a male to be born, the queen shows resentment of the traditional views of a woman being nothing more than a vessel, with her father only seeing her as a woman to give birth to a proper ruler by betraying him and killing him as she becomes the central villain and takes over. Other uses of feudal Korean culture include signal fires to alert for emergencies, conflicting the people if the Japanese were invading again, fighting with the advent of cannons, kites, and older fighting styles to effectively take down the infected make for a much more different take on combating the undead. As stated before, most zombie media defaults to making a last stand within a fortified area with plenty of automatic firearms and sometimes melee weaponry if push comes to shove. But seeing the use of now rudimentary but effective means makes the action all the more sweeter. Tradition also plays a hand in the way people will value history and preservation over their very life. As shown by the historians within the castle that fought to conceal and protect the scrolls and portraits of past and present kings, dying by the zombie horde's hands as they were able to only conceal very few portraitures and relinquish their life. And the final battle and the way it all culminated culminated within the darkest night above the icy lake with the great fight of the land's highest, strongest, and some elite warriors dressed as the common man, not seeing the threat before them until it is right in front of their face. As much as a pandemic that slowly creeps up to the population that ravages their numbers as it comes to light. Breaking the ice. Uh, sorry for the pun. It falls under every man alive to sacrifice and fight till their bitter end. This fight had me guffawed, thinking every single person we came to love, hate, and more was meeting their demise. 
But thanks to the structure established of the virus as we have come to learn it, the characters and their drive to do what is right for their country and their fellow man, and to overcome no matter what, gives us that big reveal, making us, or at least me, go, oh, oh, shit! But what can convey a story more than tradition, and what class divide can more than characters? Every character is conflicted in what tradition may be slowing them down, especially with Lee Chang. But what is more impactful in a story more than culture, more than class divide? Well, it's the characters themselves. A narrative is nothing without rich characters to interact with and drive the story. We have already discussed certain characters to an extent, like Lee Chang and his indomitable drive to do what is right outside of his own interest. He is the dominant figure in Kingdom, after all. His impact is not only of the hero, but as the good that can come from those in power and to bring honor to the family name. His constant sacrifices and putting himself at risk for others, constantly at odds with himself, forced to doubt his righteous duty to take the empty throne, and being forced to behead his own father, all while these zombies are constantly about to destroy the country that he leads and cares for so dear. His numerous battles, choices, and convictions culminate in the season 2 finale as they lay atop the ice. All of his companions are down, and to make the zombies fall into the ice below into the cold, dark water, he must break the ice on his own, trying to bash it with a gun, and then eventually almost breaking his hand by punching the ice so vehemently, and in the end, using the zombie itself to break the ice and end the epidemic, but losing himself in the process. But thankfully, like I said earlier, water cures this disease. But even after the plague is taken care of and the Cho clan has been taken care of, he still wishes to be pronounced dead so that his illegitimate brother may take the throne. Which one do we need more to rule this starving, plague-ridden country torn apart by war? Maybe the only hope left for our kingdom. The ones who intended to use him to seize power for themselves have all been killed by now. Guide this prince to rule. So that he can become a wise and a fair king. Please write that the war killed my father. As well as the queen whom I called mother. And I was killed too. That is how the history should read. This is the gift that I offer this land. Lee Chang gives up on a life of royalty for reasons including, since the child of the Cho clan would be in power, the Cho clan and their allies would have no reason to rebel and cause further turmoil in the foreseeable future. Number two, with the king's blood and so many others on his hands, many people of the kingdom would be weary of having the man that killed the king his father sitting in the throne, even though it was his only choice. He still lives with that guilt. And finally, he relinquishes the title of prince so that he may find out more about the resurrection herb and the plague with Sobi, so that the nation may never face such an evil once again. By the crown prince's side stood his companions, Sobi, the nurse, who through thick and thin did whatever she could to decipher the intricacies of the resurrection herb and the parasites that emanated from it. Much like Li Chang, she too is selfless in her actions, but more so will do whatever she can to help and protect the weak, including the old and young alike. Her character is integral, showing how no matter the class, all those around her wish to keep her alive for her extensive medical knowledge during this plague's outbreak. Even as just an assistant to the leading doctor, it's shown how important medical knowledge is. In this trying time. Yeah. Even the queen and Lord Cho, who are quick to kill anyone, make sure to keep her alive. But even after all of that, she still shows remorse for those who are injured or killed for reckless reasons. She worked as a physician and worked to fulfill her promise to heal people regardless of their personal beliefs and actions. She saved the life of the Cho clan leader, Hak Chu, despite being the cause of every major issue leading up to that point. She saved his life, but also learned more of the parasites as she saved his life. Her intellect surrounding the nature of the herb makes her a powerful character, not through fighting choreography, skill, or bloodline, but purely through her knowledge. Knowledge. Her character embodying selflessness for the common man as a physician's creed, and in times of medical outbreaks, no one can be more important than a doctor or nurse with some know-how. 
Also accompanying the former crown prince on his journey at the end is the tiger hunter Yong Shin, whose sole purpose is fighting to get revenge for what happened to his village. His expertise in fighting, whether it be for the Korean military during the war or fighting dangerous beasts and animals, he knows every facet of combat with anything that may come his way. Working as the parallel to So Bi's brain, Shin is the brawn. At the beginning, he's nothing more than a wandering, fighting man looking for revenge, but through Li Cheng, he finds direction in his life and looks to right the wrongs that the country has been dealt with. Despite losing everything, he still acts to save others in their time of need, much like Li Cheng, who he comes to admire. Although he is also a driving factor in the beginning of the major zombie outbreak, as it was his advice of using the corpse of the dead assistant as meat for a stew. I will do whatever it takes to survive. So he may also be trying to right the wrong that he was partially to blame for. It was his methods of herd survival to cannibalize the dead that developed the strain of the virus that could spread more effectively. Lord Anhyan was a short stint in Chang's presence during the series, but an honorable man that instilled in the crown prince virtue, resilience, and honor since he was a child. Having been a war hero that led the defeat of thousands of Japanese soldiers, he spent his days post-war mourning his lost mother. However, this victory had come at the cost of sacrificing innocent people and turning them into zombies where he had witnessed firsthand these monstrosities. His morals were put into question in the time since, and he himself must face them as he opposes Cho Hakju and eventually sacrifices his own body, which, after his death, has to be brought back by the resurrection herb to show the people directly what the virus was and what it can do and what it did to the king as the Cho clan had done before. Since the Cho clan was behind the curse that was upon his life for the sacrifices that were forced upon the poor civilian people. Symbolically, once he did show his bloodied, zombified face, he had the flag of the province impaled through his body, also draped in blood, showing the bloody struggle the land was undergoing through this political strife. And even more ironically, An Hyun bites Hakju in the face before falling down permanently. An Hyun had forced the infection that Hakju had wanted to use to his own devices in order to gain an upper hand, whether it be the Japanese-Korean War or through his own means to power. We had already discussed pretty in detail the clan members of the Cho clan pretty in depth, but it still goes without saying that their actions were despicable. It gave for a valid connection of corruption infecting the country and destroying the populace. Hakju's actions leading to his son's beheading, the torture of many innocents to gain the upper hand, and almost falling victim to the plague to be shown as the two-faced monster that he is, pretending to be a man of the people, but in reality, just somebody that was trying to overthrow the royal bloodline to take the throne. His untimely death at the hands of his daughter had shown that amongst a den of wolves like the Cho clan, the ones they had to fear were not the royal blood, their armies, or the zombies. The ones they had to fear were each other. The queen's lifeless stare had shown how greatly this inhumane tirade for power had made her a soulless human, hungry for nothing but control, even willing to die if it means to lose all of that, using a stolen baby to make that happen. Chang's bodyguard, Mu Yong, embodies the idea of loyalty through thick and thin. Being the 1600s version of Train to Busan's daddy, ooh yeah. He works hard to keep his pregnant wife healthy and often stole food from the crown prince to keep her fed, often wanting beef over anything else. I heard that tonight we will be served beef cakes. <laughs> and uh... Beefcakes. My boy loves his meat. I just wonder if he's gonna have any pudding. After being caught for this heinous act, Li Chang did not reprimand him, but asked for his undying loyalty, which he gave in full. Although Cho Hakju used this loyalty to his advantage by threatening to kill Mu Yong's wife if he did not feed information back to the Cho clan on Li Cheng's whereabouts. This dilemma of his wife and his master being loyal to both would constantly tear him apart from the inside, but ultimately, when he is tasked with bringing the infected Cho Hakju back to his home, is betrayed and shot to death by arrows only to be found in the cold loneliness of the forest in his master's arms, doing what he could all throughout this journey by fighting by his master's side while doing the bidding of his enemy 
to keep his wife and future child safe. His loyalty would never waver, even to his dying breath. I'm sorry for failing to protect you to the very end. Although sadly, his wife would pass on, and his child, a much different fate. And the first and only born of Mu Yang, stolen by the queen to usurp power, and saved by the innocent So Bi, was bitten thanks to his ill-gotten mother's reckless abandon. As stated earlier, infants cannot have these parasites invade their brain, as they are not fully developed possibly symbolizing how the purity of innocence cannot be corrupted by evil yet. Chang and one of his followers once agreed that if the baby were to live, This child must be put to death by your hand. As long as this child lives, this terror will never end. That child is the legitimate heir to the throne. He is the only threat to your rule. He will bring chaos across the country. After a seven year time skip, the new king is gradually instructed how to lead the province as Li Chang himself wished to be pronounced dead. This young king is never told the truth about the death of his parents and brother, only being given the explanation of a plague, making him question those around him and question the festering whelp on his hand. In the final moments of the season, we see the parasites that had harbored in his hand for so many years making their way back to his brain, possibly causing the start of another outbreak that stems from yet another unknowing king. Kingdom is a rich story with unforgettable characters, insane twists, standard breaking zombies, and something to put even Game of Thrones to bed. It's an experience I haven't felt in a series in years. Every plot, subplot, character, and the flow of it all kept me enthralled all throughout. I haven't gone, WHAT?! at a grand reveal in a show in forever, and the moment where Mu Yong passed away, 1600's daddy dying in the snow. Oh, it was ripping up my heartstrings, man. <laughs> I mean, hell, what Kingdom does in a two-minute scene would have been stretched out to cover an entire season in The Walking Dead. They don't restrict their stories. They don't make them, they don't stretch them out to fill out a whole season. They make it to where their story has purpose in every episode. It's a series I definitely recommend. And if you watch this without viewing it once before, well, you know what's gonna happen, but still, I recommend giving this hidden gem of a show a chance. I'm eagerly awaiting season three, and I hope you are too. So what did you think of this different take on a zombie series? What did you like about it? Did I see way too much into this and sound like a pretentious high school English teacher? Did I miss out on some information? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to have a discussion on the narrative elements of the story you enjoyed, disliked, or want to dig more into. If you want to check out my other content, I go similarly in depth on movies like Shaun of the Dead and Train to Busan with some added tears to boot. If you want to support the channel, a simple like and sub is all I really ask for. That's what drives me to making more videos. But if you feel inclined, you can donate in an of ways as well, from being a tank level donator, a patron on my Patreon where you can see videos before they release on YouTube like a week before, becoming a member on the channel, or just throwing in a few bucks during my live streams of Left 4 Dead. Get you some merch as well, and you can have your pick with the merch featured here. Thank you Smokey Dogo, or Doggo, for the support of the channel with your merch. Anyways, that's enough shilling out of the way. Thank you for watching this ramble of a video. I hope you like the series and I hope you check it out. I hope you guys are staying healthy and more importantly, I hope you are staying well. Love ya and see you next time.